All right. So as you're aware, your midterm is next week. Um, it is 45 multiple choice questions. It is technically closed book. It is also going to be on Brightspace, which means it's going to be open laptop. Um, I am not going to sit at the back of the room and stare at everybody's screens. So, you know, take that whichever way you want. Considering there's really nowhere at the back of the room for me to sit anyways in this particular room, it doesn't lend itself to uh, spying on my students. Um, technically, it's an hour and a half in class, but honestly, 45 questions should be about an hour, if that. Um, it's it's 20% of your final grade. And essentially, it's going to cover uh, ER diagrams. It's going to talk about entities, attributes, and relationships. Um, normalization, first, second, and third normal form. And they're not, these aren't, you know, you're going to fill in blanks and that kind of stuff. These are all multiple guess. So they're mostly like, you know, the definition, definition of second normal form is X, Y, Z. Or there could be a diagram that says, you know, the relationship from this to this is this kind of thing. Uh, it's going to be a few questions about database design, uh, potentially asking about data types and whatnot. And then indexes and views, which is the current lab. All right. So as a quick review, what's an entity? It's a thing. It could be a person, a place, an object, an event, pretty much any kind of concept uh, that data needs to be maintained about. Um, book, customer, school, students, those are all kinds of things you could diagram. Attributes, they, there's a few different kinds. Uh, single valued attributes, there's only one value. Um, and this is where the terminology that was used in this course is a little misleading. Um, they use the phrase multi valued attribute, uh, which is a thing that has more than one value, also known as a list. Um, versus repeating groups of rows, which is something totally unrelated. Uh, but yeah, a multi valued attribute, if nothing else, is a list, so list of phone numbers, list of skills, that kind of thing. Um, there's such thing as composite attributes, uh, such as a person's name that's made up of multiple pieces, or a uh, an address, which is obviously made up of multiple pieces also. And you're going to be tested on relationships, one-to-one, -one, one to many, many to many. Um, I'm going to be going through an entire no, no, tail to nose design later that's going to cover some of these topics anyways. Um, but essentially, a one-to-one -one relationship would be the equivalent of a country having a single prime minister or president. Um, One-to-many would be a project manager manages multiple projects, but our project is only ever managed by one manager. Um, Many-to-many, -many, um, students to classes. Obviously, you guys have multiple courses, and each course has multiple students, so it's many-to-many. And we have our cardinality notations. We've got like the one and only one. Hello. Cool. It's bouncing off something. There was an invisible person blocking my laser for a second. All right. So yeah. So you got the one to one, uh, one and only one, which means it's it it's required and it only allows one. One or more means it's required, but there could be multiple. So that would be an example of an order has one or more order lines because an order is not an order unless there's something in it. Each order line only belongs to one order and it has to have an order. And then you've got the, the optional versions of it. So zero or more and zero or one. Um, Zero more would be for optional statuses. For example, you got an order. It hasn't been shipped yet, so we don't know what the tracking system that uh, the uh, courier they're using. So at that point, the courier is optional. A courier may be used many times or not used at all. And a order can have one courier only or not at all, depending on the status. So those are the four of those. And when we talk about uh, maximum, minimum, maximum cardinality, um, 
essentially it's the outer line right here is the the uh, minimum the outs the inner one is the maximum which is basically each bank account has one and only one customer each customer has at least one bank account if not more that's what that means and we already did this big diagram before earlier in the term and I talked about it while I was doing the design and it's totally unreadable on the screen and believe it or not it's totally unreadable on my screen too so it's just a blurry mess um what's cool though because you can download the, the 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 powerpoint you can actually cut that image out and it's actually bigger it's just the size of powerpoint decided to scale it to fit that screen resolution whatever that is up there all right normalization normalization is there to reduce redundancy uh it makes things more efficient uh avoids duplicated data uh it uses less space it remove and also normalization removes anomalies. So it removes insertion anomaly, which means when you add data, you're forced to duplicate data, some other piece of data to make it work. So you are adding a new patient at the dentist's office, and you have to add another dentist, the, the dentist right away because the, their database is stupid. That's kind of set up. A deletion anomaly means when you remove data, it forces a user to lose data. Um, which we did at the normalization slides. Uh, modification means you have to update uh, data in multiple rows, potentially in multiple places. Um, what the example we had in the original slides was we had the employee table, where if we had to update, uh, I think it was Mary's salary, we had to update it in two places. And yes, today's computers are faster and odds are you'd never even notice However, it's still a bad thing because you have to do it in multiple places. Yep. Well, the more anomalies are present, it's going to slow down your queries. Yes, it's also going to cause unnecessary I.O. Uh, it's just going to eat the performance overall. And um, there's always a risk of damaging the data. Yep. Or having yeah, adding duplicates, having to update multiple places, deleting things by accident. Okay, so this is the phrase that threw everybody off for normal for normalization because the way they, the people that created these slides, whoever created these slides originally, decided to make the examples a little weird. All right, so first normal form is we need to identify and remove multi-valued attributes. Now, what they went and did is they're conflating. So I don't know if so most of you don't know what the word conflating means. It means that you're taking two different concepts and and mixing them up so that you don't really know which one you're talking about anymore. And what they did is, and I noticed this during the normalization lab, people were getting really confused over some of the wording, especially if English wasn't your first language, where you just learned to accept the words and just ignore it because, you know, it is what it is. So what they went and did is they conflated the concept of multi-valued attributes and repeating groups of rows. And essentially, they are the same thing at a base principle, but it could be more complicated than that, um, depending on a few other situations, which would actually be involving normal fourth or fifth normal form, which we didn't cover in this course. So essentially, it's as far as whoever designed the course, they decided that a multi-valued attribute was the same thing as a repeating group of rows, uh, columns, I mean. Um, so in this case, this first record has two phone numbers. And the way you would fix it, technically, would be to fill in the rest of the row. Uh, but because the way this is set up, um, it's set up kind of dumb. Because the second we do this, we're actually breaking the first, the primary primary key, which is why everybody was confused. So this is supposed to be a list, not a column. That's the problem with all the examples you guys were given. Um, but essentially, when I go through the example I'm gonna do with you guys, it's gonna be significantly more sane, let's say, than this example. 
So first normal form is there is no repeating groups of rows or no multi-valued attributes. Take your pick. They mean right now, they mean the exact same thing. And you have a primary key that's defined. Uh, second normal form, you must be first in first normal form and partial dependencies must be removed. A partial dependency is an attribute that is not part of the key and is determined by the key. So in this case, the customer ID determines the phone, the bank account number determines the type, but this has nothing to do with the customer ID. This has nothing to do with the bank account number. Therefore, this column depends on only part of the key and this column depends on only part of the key. This usually happens because you've got multiple entity types in the same entity. So basically you've got, an, you've got a table and you've got multiple kinds of things sharing the space at the same time and that's not good. So how do we fix it? We break it into two tables or more as applicable. So second normal form is it must be in first normal form and you remove partial dependencies. Now you're in second normal form. Third normal form. You can't be in third normal form unless you're already in second normal form. You can't skip steps. Um, I had a student in my class yesterday that is a little argumentative. Um, and he could not understand why you went through each of the steps. And I finally came up with an example. You know, when you do a math, you do a math test, you might know what the answer is, but you'll still get a zero if you don't show the steps. Finally, that got it through his head. This is what normalization is about. You do each of the steps, you go through each of the steps until you have an end result. Somebody who's been doing this for a long time, like I have, will skip steps because it just happens. But when you're first doing it, you go through the steps so you don't screw up. All right, so to be in third normal form, you have to be in second normal form and then get rid of the transitive dependencies. Transitive dependencies is the concept that a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their brains around. Um, some people get it right away and some people don't. So, I mean, when I say people have, I'm generalizing. Um, a transitive dependency is when an attribute that is not part of the key depends on another attribute that is also not part of the key. So in this example we've got right here is the department name is determined by the department ID, which is not part of the key, which in turn is de de blah, determined by the employee ID. Now, usually the example I use for this, and I think I might've discussed this with you guys, um, is it's a piece of, uh, relational math. So if you say A determines B and B determines C, that means A also determines C. Right? Because basically you're going, if you write it like this, determines C. Those are the worst errors I've ever driven drawn. Um, if it's all in one line, that means that a also determines C, which is a transitive dependency. So if you're trying to find a way to visualize the issue here is the department name is determined by the ID. The ID is determined by the employee ID. That's all there is to that one. So how do you fix that problem? You break it out into its own table, um, which apparently was the problem my student yesterday was having. I understand why you just didn't break everything down to small tables on the first step. So essentially you create uh, another table for anything that is, for any determinant that determines, any determinant that is not the key, you take it and its attributes out into its own place and you leave a foreign key behind. So when we do this, they're both in third normal form. And Boyce Cod, for all the fun that we had discussing it, literally it summarizes as follows. This is more of a theoretical concept and it's not widely used in practice. Usually third normal form is more than good enough. Yeah, that literally that's all you need to know about Boyce Cod. <laughs>
it exists. It does have a place. And normally it rarely ever happens unless you, unless the data you're being given is really stupid. Uh, Boy Scout is there to handle a very specific, what they call an edge case, as in the data looks a certain way and behaves a certain way. And it only behaves that way with that set of data. That means you need to do these special steps to clean it up. Um, yeah. All right, so in database design, we have identification, uh, describe relationships, normalization, and review. Um, so one of the things we have to do is you have to resolve many to many relationships. And that's another one that some people have a hard time with is the whole um, many to many thing. And the big issue with many to many is that database servers, and I'm generalizing again, because there are a few that allow this, um, do not physically allow you to create many to many. There is no such thing in a database server. You resolve a many to many relationship by creating an associative entity. In other words, it's a table that contains the keys, the parent tables. So it would look like this when you're done. And so essentially you take the key, if it's many to many going across like this, many to many on each side, you create a table in the middle and this table has many names. Um, the most common name is called an associative entity. But I've also heard it a bridge table. I've all heard it also called it a map table. Uh, it's also sometimes referred to as an intersection table, depending on what definition you want to use. And I've even heard it called a has and belong to many table. Just different terminology, it all mean the exact same thing. So you resolve a many to many relationship by creating a third entity that contains the primary keys of each of the tables participating in many to many. All right, indexes and views. As you can see, the slides are even a little bit different than the rest. Um, this course used to have indexes and views after the break, but that was only the first year where we went to 14 weeks with the reading week in the middle. And then for that one year that we were off, we had six weeks and then instead of being seven and seven, we had six and eight, um, which is why this slide looks so different than the rest. Okay. Indexes. Indexes are data structures that help find location data easily and allows for the efficient query of data. In other words, it's an invisible object in the database that basically maps the physical location of data in the table with a, basically an organized, an organized index that shows where things are, just like an index in a book. All right, so it's like an index in a book. There's a list of topics with a page number. The index in the database works very similarly. It keeps an, a list of words that you need to search or values mapped to specific locations in the database. If you overdo indexes, it can slow things down. I went through that in a fair amount of detail about how many, for every index you add, it adds four read and write operations. Uh, it occupies more space. So you got to be careful. Um, unique indexes are usually used for primary keys um, because primary keys must be unique. Therefore, it's a unique index. However, you can actually create unique indexes on other data, um, specifically when you want to control duplicate values. A common one I've seen is email address. Another one is phone number. Uh, never put a unique key on a, on pre people's names. It's a very bad idea. Um, Non-unique keys, uh, those are usually used for information that is accessed frequently, but is not a primary key. Again, email address would be one. Uh, phone number, people's names, postal codes, uh, depending on what you're working with, product codes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, views. Views allow information to be presented dif differently than, um, yep, I'm going to go shut a door. 
this one. Oof. This is a crappy classroom for many reasons. Being so it's a junction of the stairs really does not help with the noise level. Can you imagine what it's like in here at like two o'clock in the afternoon? It, it is terrible. I've taught in here at two in the afternoon. It's even with the doors closed, you can't hear yourself. So views is a structure in the database that essentially takes a pre-canned query and it behaves like a table. So it's a virtual table. Um, it allows you to um, sometimes change the layout of the database. So let's say you've had to update the structure of the database for whatever reason, but you have some old applications that talk to it. In theory, you could actually put in views so the old applications can continue talking to it. Or you want to hide columns from specific users. So depending on their access level, they get a different view. There's a few different purposes for views, or you just have really complicated queries that you want to save for later use and not have to remember how to write them. And we have two kinds of views. Uh, we have the virtual view, also known as a dynamic view. Uh, it's used in databases, it's computed on demand. Uh, it will take up the exact amount of processing power as if you wrote the query from scratch and hit run. There's, it doesn't cost extra to run, but it doesn't save you anything either. It's all you're doing is just running a query and it you know takes up just that much time. Uh, materialized views is usually used in data warehousing and uh, business intelligence. It'll help speed up queries because the view is pre-computed offline. By offline, it means like when people aren't actually using the database. Um, this is usually used to summarize sales data, uh, summarize statistics, um, sometimes used heavily in scientific applications where they're collecting a lot of data through the day and then they want to have summarized values of it. So instead of writing, running queries against millions of rows and it takes, you know, 30, 40 seconds for the query to come back against the materialized view, it might come back in less than a second because it doesn't need to do all the math. It doesn't need to sift through all the rows and figure that out. Um, it's, that's literally what they're for. So what happens when we query a view? A view is not a true table, so it doesn't contain data, at least the dynamic ones. So when we query a view, it accesses the source table to capture the data. In other words, it's as if you ran the query, it grabs the results and passes it out to you. Um, if you need to modify the data, do it with standard insert updates against the real table. Don't try to do it against the view because it's an absolute pain in the back end, figuratively and physically, to actually try to do updatable views. Because essentially, to make a view updatable, you have to expose so much of the underlying table that you might as well be using the table. Um, so syntax to create or replace a view, it's create or replace view, view name as, and then you have your standard select statement for everybody's enjoyment. Um, you can also update a view technically if you have all the right pieces uh, that belong there. And a view is not always updatable. Uh, specific criteria in the query can make a view non-updatable. Anything that has a group by, anything that has a distinct, anything that has a count, if you don't include every column that is not null, you don't include the primary keys, you won't be able to make an updatable view. So if you're literally including all the not null columns, plus the primary key, plus whatever it is you're actually trying to do with it, you might as well just be updating and inserting, updating and deleting against the original table. Okay, so that having been said, the other item I want to mention is I've noticed that a few people might be struggling with SQL a little. Um, and there's certain things that you may or may not have been taught that you might actually need to do the view lab, FYI. Uh, if last term is any example of what, what you guys are coming in with and a few questions I've fielded already so far this week, um, 
you might need a little more SQL than what you were taught in level one. Which is not bad news for you guys. Because it's a good thing I don't monetize my YouTube channel. Uh, because I'm going to say, if you guys go look at the 8215, so... You look at CSTP 215 and you look at anything from the week seven lectures. So week seven to about week eight, seven, eight, nine, ten ish. Uh, it'll give you a very um, fast paced yet detailed uh, SQL review. And I am covering stuff that Doug didn't cover, just so you know. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, if you're, if you're struggling trying to understand how to do some of the queries for that lab, go take a review in my, in my thing. All right, so, and I'm gonna put it out right now. I'm not even gonna enforce the due date of, uh, I think it's this Friday for that lab, because historically the problems you guys have had not you, you, but level two database with this lab uh, because, you know, your SQL skills are, have strange little holes. Like they covered certain topics, but then they didn't cover other topics that are related to it that really just that next step. Um, how not to abuse subqueries instead of, instead of using joins, that kind of thing. Um, different profs like different topics differently. I tried to cover them all equally. Okay, so that's the review. Like I said, I was going to fly through it pretty quick, and actually I wasn't even planning to spend half an hour on it. Okay, so since I've only got two boards, uh, that's going to stay up there. <laughs> We've got ourselves a set of data. And it's one that I haven't used in this class yet. Um, it's similar to the one I used with my level ones yesterday. Uh, modified a little bit so that I, with them, I did the CAD to work twice by making it more complicated the second time. I'm just going to do all in one go with you guys. So I've got a piece of data here, a pile of data, and it's not a very big pile. That is hours being billed. And we have employees, we have how much they cost when we have project. And currently, this is not in first normal form. Why is this not in first normal form? Yeah, so there's actually a few issues. So this is a repeating group of columns, also known as, according to the slides, a multi-valued attribute. But in this case, it's a multi-value attributes that occupy multiple columns. So it's a repeating group of columns. So that's issue number one. So essentially, this group belongs together. This group belongs together. It also doesn't have a primary key defined. So the first thing we do is we want to... Yeah, we're just going to copy paste because we're lazy. No, I don't want to create an event. Oh, come on. It's because of the date doesn't mean you want to create an event. All right. So now we don't have repeating groups of columns anymore because we populated the whole thing. Yeah, until you hit the next one. Yes, when you get something of that nature, usually you'll see this in a report or an export. So they'll run a report, but they export it as a CSV and you'll have like gaps in the data. And usually in these kinds of systems is whatever value is there before the first gap is the value that applies to that gap until you hit another value. Unless specified, yeah, unless otherwise specified. Uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to figure out our primary key. And this one's a good one because it's a three-parter. It's a compound key that actually takes three things. So essentially, when we're talking about billing timesheets, what's important is the number of hours being billed. So the number of hours being billed is 
what's tying everything together. And when we look at this, how do we, which combination of columns allows us to grab the entire row? Now, in theory, we could get away with just the employee and the project number, in theory. However, if I were to suddenly do, whoa, calm down, Excel. Oh, well, that's not a date. What is that? Like that. Now, suddenly, just the employee number and the project number is not good enough. Because the way it was set up before, if we didn't have the billing dates, I'm going to take this away really quick. If we take the billing date away, we can't ever bill an employee for the same project twice. And anybody who's ever worked in contracting, you realize that you often bill for the same task twice because it just so happens it started before the billing date and ended after the billing date. Therefore, it needs to be billed twice. What? There we go. And it's mangling my data again. Good job, Excel. So in this case, we end up having to have a three-way primary key, which includes the billing date. So I'm going to mark the primary key on here. As such. Yeah, it's a composite primary key based by grabbing those three pieces of data, we can uniquely identify the entire row. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to transcribe that first row on the board, and then I'm going to work from here. Uh, these boards are really small, so it's going to be interesting. So I'm going to call my object timesheet for now. And we have, and I'm actually going to shorten a lot of these column names for now because I really don't have a lot of room. I've got the employee number. I've got name, email, uh, rate ID, rate, project number, project description, and hours, right? Hours. All right, so, I mean, I gave myself no vertical space. So now I'm going to mark my primary keys because we've already know what those are. Primary keys are blue. All right. So there's my primary keys. It's the exact same thing we got up there. This is in So the first thing we need to do is identify what is fully dependent. And we basically, as we were figuring out our primary key, we do we did figure out that if nothing else, the hours is fully dependent. Because rate, the rate ID, email, and name all belongs to the employee number. The project description belongs to the project just the hours that belongs to the whole keys. So we know this is the entire entity. The the that that's the one that one thing that's fully dependent. Good. So but we do know there's other issues in here. So for example, we know the project description depends on only the project number. So that's a partial dependency. So partials are going to be in orange. And we happen to know that the rate, rate ID, email, and name all depend 
on the employee number. So there's our partials. We are not worrying about the transitives yet. There is a transitive in here, uh, but we're not going to worry about it yet because that is for third normal form. We got to do the work properly and get ourselves in 2F before we go to 3NF. Yeah, so we need to create basically three entities right now. This green is going to be one entity. The two blocks of oranges are also going to be entities. So I'm going to create three entities as follows. So I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to start with the employee, which has the name, email, ID, and the rate. We have the uh, project which has the project and the description. And we have timesheet. which has a billing date the employee number and uh, the project number actually the employee id right uh, employee number whatever number and the hours okay now this one's a special one because it has a three part compound key as such, but two of these are also foreign keys. So, which leads us to two things the employee is a strong entity. because it can live on its own. Its primary key is unique to itself. It has no dependencies on anything else to exist. The project is also a strong entity. Because again, the project can exist without anything else. The timesheet is a weak entity. Yes. So this one is weak because the foreign keys participate in the primary key. You cannot find the primary key without values of the foreign key. Therefore, if it can't, it can't be defined without relying on something else, it's a weak entity. Yep. In theory, yes, you could later when you're doing the physical design. And as when you're doing the normalization, you don't add data you don't remove data you work with what you've got okay so now this one this one's in 3nf and this one's in 3nf because the attributes depend on the key right so the hours needs all three pieces of the key the description needs all three is the key. However, employee currently is in second normal form. It's set in second normal form because we have we have a transitive dependency, which is rate to rate ID. The P number determines the rate ID they are at, but because of that it also determines the rate. So how do we fix this? We break it out to its own entity. We just keep breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces until 
no longer needed. So now I'm going to transcribe all of this on the other board. I'll come back with my markers in a minute. And that should be rate ID, not rate. Okay. So, employee, employee is still a strong entity, even though it has a foreign key. But it's strong because the foreign key is not part of the primary key. And right now we're going to assume that the rate ID is nullable. Why? In a consulting company, not everybody gets billed out. For example, the company I work for, we do custom work for some of our customers. So we sell our own brand software. We also rebrand our software for people. So they'll send sell special equipment and they want software. They don't want to write it themselves. So they ask us to make them a custom version and they give us a lot of money to do that. Um, and each of us have different billing rates and it often, it depends on how expensive you are to the company. I've been with this company for almost 23 years. I'm expensive. I am a rate four. So what we call rate four, at least in my company, it means that for every hour that I work, they bill for four. It's good. On the other hand, I don't get to see that money. It just means I'm going to get a bonus at the end of the year. <laughs> On the other hand, our receptionist is a rate null because we don't. She doesn't get to work on the client stuff. She answers the phone and greets people at the door. She has nothing to do with shipping software, except for meeting the FedEx guy with a sack of boxes every once in a while, saying, "This is the pile of box for you to take today." We don't bill that time. So depending on people, the rates change, which in this case, the rate ID is null for the receptionist because she's still an employee, but she doesn't actually cost us an hourly cost, but not, she's not an income center. She's a cost center. So a rate ID, somebody who has a rate ID is potentially an, uh, an income center. And the rest of these are done. So as of this board, the normalization process is done. We have our four entities, we have our primary keys, we have our foreign keys, we have no repeated columns of anything other than the foreign keys. If we need to change a value of a rate, we can change it once and it affects everything that has that rate. Uh, we want to update the description of our project, we only have to change it in one place. Uh, we want to adjust an employee's rate and just change the rate for that one employee. And I'm gonna be taking pictures. because I'm going to be erecting some of this and continuing. The glare is terrible. 
Do you guys get as much glare back there as my phone's getting? Okay. So, I'm going to erase this board. Because this is done. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that into a conceptual diagram. You know, for an eraser that's missing most of itself, it actually works pretty good. All right, so we are going to put in four boxes. Yep. So we're going to do the old style diagrams of the boxes, the diamonds, and the ovals. So we have employee. We have Rates. We have time sheets. Dex. Fantastic. So the first thing we're going to do is draw our relationships. And we know that our relationships such because we have our foreign keys. So we know roughly where the lines are going to go. So we are going to put in our relationships like this. Now we have our relationships and we still need to put in our cardinalities. So We'll start with the employees and the rates. So we know that an employee has one rate, might not have any rate, right? The receptionist doesn't have a rate. The developers do. So, well, no, each employee has one. So we're worrying about its, its rule, so it's going to be over here. An employee has one rate maximum and maybe no rates. So it's zero or one rate for each employee because the rate is nullable. Yeah, exactly. On the other hand, each two, one or more employees, but potentially we could have a rate that's not used because maybe we don't have anybody of that class for that rate anymore. So the rate is optional on that side too. So the way we'd read this is this is a relationship. The employee has zero or one rate. Each rate is zero or many employees. Our projects to timesheets. A timesheet, since the project number is required, it's mandatory, and each timesheet entry for only one project. So it's mandatory one. Now in theory, a project may never have been built yet. So there might not be a timesheet entry for it. So, but it could be used in multiple projects. So it's an optional mini. And the employee has the exact same rules as the project. Like that. So this is a, again, this is also one to many, and this is also one to many, or actually one to many in that direction. Okay, so now what's missing is our attribute. So this is what they call a classic ERD, a classic Chen ERD. In other words, it shows the entities and their relationships, but not the attributes. The second I start slapping attributes on this, it's now considered what they call an extended ERD, an EERD. And we're going to do our rates one here. So we know we have a rate ID and a rate. So we're going to go rate ID and a rate like such. 
And I'm going to leave my blue marker here for now. That's our primary key. We have an employee number. We have a name. ID, and we have an email. And the, this style of diagram, you don't always have to put in the foreign keys. In this case, we are. However, the thing is about the foreign keys, uh, there is no special notation. So, there's no underline or, you know, brack uh, parentheses to show it's a compound attribute or um, curlies to show that it's a list of values. It just sits there like a regular attribute. So there's nothing special about it. The project has a project number. And a description. And the timesheet is a compound attribute. We have a billing date. We have an employee number. And we have the hours. like such. And now we've converted our normalization notation to a conceptual diagram. So this shows you the relationship, the rules of the relationships. You can see there's a few different kinds. It shows our attributes and our entities. The diagram, it's a picture. I'm going to erase this one. So the last step we have is converting this to a physical diagram. I'll upload the pictures to Brightspace later. So. I'm going to start with, um, actually, start with the rate over here. Okay, so technically right now what I have is a logical diagram because it doesn't have data types. But I'm just going to say this is what a logical diagram would look like if I did it, the whole thing like that but I'm going to go right to physical because there's really not that much of a difference. All right, so if we look at data, so we're back looking at the screen finally, and we look at our data, you'll notice that our rate ID seems to be an integer. That's pretty safe. And then you have the rate here, which is currently looks like an integer. Uh, but, so we're going to make our rate Yeah, I'm not going to do that on here, but yeah. So the rate technically is a money one because we charge an hourly rate. So if normally when you do money, you want to have at least have some decimal places and you get people that get clever where they say, I'm going to use a double or I'm going to use a float because they want an infinite number of decimal places or they want an infinitely large rate, which is stupid um, because you should have the data types in your database represent real things. So most people use something either called a numeric or a decimal. They are the same. The reason why people wouldn't necessarily use a money data type is not all database servers have a money data type. And the funny thing is, is that money in Postgres is not the same as money in MySQL, and it's not the same thing as currency in Microsoft SQL Server. 
they're not interchangeable. So when you try to design your database, you try to go um, what they basically call ISO standard, as you make it as cl close to cross-platform as possible. So you'll use a generic data type whenever possible. Decimal or numeric, because all database servers recognize them, they're aliases of each other, they're the same thing. Allows you to define a maximum size of the number and how many decimal places in it. So for a rate, we're going to use numeric because why not? Numeric, and we're going to go five comma two. Five comma two means I can put in Yes, so that's what the 5-2 means. So one is the size, the other one's the precision of the decimal places. So if I did 6-3, that would allow me to go three decimal places of precision. Yes. They're the same thing. Um, depending on what database server you're working with, one will use decimal as its internal type. But we'll still re recognize numeric. Other ones will use numeric as its internal type and still recognize decimal because the ISO standard states that they're the same thing. So Postgres recognizes both, MySQL recognizes both, Microsoft SQL Server recognizes both. Oracle, I don't know. I haven't worked with Oracle since I was in college. That was 1996, <laughs> just so you know. So it's been a while. Um, now our rate ID is also our primary key. So we're going to draw in our primary key. Next one we're going to put in is our employee. We have our employee number, name, email, and rate ID like such. Okay, employee number looks to be an integer. So we're going to go treat it as an integer. Fantastic. And we know that's our primary key, so I'll just put that in right now. Name. Name can be rough. In this case, we're just doing a compound name. In other words, we just have a single field for a person's name. Depending what part of the world you come from, your names can be very, very long. Yeah, VARCAR 255 is a little excessive, but yes, you'd use VARCAR, which is where we'd start. So we use a VARCAR because we know it's a variable length job. And usually a safe one for a person's name is 100 to 125 characters. Now, some people in here are going to go, why do you need 100 characters for a person's name? Let me tell you, about 10 years ago, I had a student in my class from Puerto Rico. Now, I don't know if some of you know how bad Hispanic names can get. And depending on what the family history is for the Hispanic name, they can get very creative. For example, if they're Roman Catholic, their first name is Joseph by default. Technically, my first name is Joseph, according to my birth certificate of the church. That's just a rule. You don't get away with it. Everybody's a Jojo. Hey, my father's name was Joseph Joseph. Come on. Literally, his name was Jojo. This kid had his first name. So he had Joseph, then his given name. And then he had seven middle names. Then his last name. He responded to every one of those names. Uh, I'm guessing... The mother's chakla was powerful. That sandal was probably coming flying on a regular basis with a random name attached to it. Because the way they did it in his family was he had his name, then his father's name, his grandfather's name, his great-grandfather's name. He just kept tacking on ancestors' names in the middle. It was absolutely insane. Even he said, you know, he's, when he has kids, he's not doing that. He says that he was the last generation of a name that was something close to 70-something characters long. So we're going to go with VARCAR 100 for it because it's safe. 
email. Email is also a VAR car. And 150 is safe. I think I told you guys the story, right? About super long email address that I, oh, okay. I always forget which groups I tell this. So here's an anecdote. This is this happened in real life to me. Like this one's a preventative measure. This one happened to me in real life. So second job out of no, sorry, third job. I forgot about the one I got fired from. So third job from college. I was working for a company called Digital Equipment. Most of you don't know who that is. They were one of the big IT companies in the Ottawa area. Like digital was bought by Compaq, which was bought by HP. Digital made its own its own processors. Um, they made mini mini computers. They made Unix servers. Uh, for a while, every computer at the Ottawa hospitals were digital equipment computers. So they had a division of they had where they had four call centers. So they had close to ten thousand call center employees in the Ottawa area. That's how big they were. And when Compaq bought them, they shipped all the jobs to India. Literally, like six months, there was not a job in Ottawa after they got bought out. But I worked in the tech support department, except I didn't help my customers. I supported the tech support agents. I wrote their software for a specific division. So if a the Ottawa hospital bought 10,000 PCs, they were given so many hours of free tech support a month on their top 10 applications that they use. So instead of having to call Microsoft for tech support, they just pick up the phone, dial an extension, and it would connect to our call center in Bell's Corners. It was really cool. Like, as far as they knew, they were calling somebody at the Ottawa hospital. But it was like, you know, about a dozen people sitting in the back corner of a former Beaver Lumber building. And one of our clients was a Department of the Government of Ontario. And back then, the email addresses of the Government of Ontario was extra stupid. Their email address format was first name dot last name at the full department name in English and French dot on dot gc which in general the email address was originally defined as 50 characters long it should have worked until we had this one person call a nice lady from Quebec she was a Quebecer that moved to Ontario for this job she had a hyphenated first name and it wasn't like Joe dash Ann it was like Mirabel dash something else dot. And then she had basically like my last name twice. Because in Quebec, when women get married, well, when people get married in Quebec, the women take, they take the, the last name of the husband and they tack it on. So they just, there's a constant rotation of the last name. That's a Quebec thing. So her last name was like Boudreau dash Goudreau. At Resources Naturelles dash natural resources dot o n dot g c. I had a tech support guy. He literally put his customer on hold, and he called me. Goes, Dan, I can't save the email record. It's crashing. I go, well, it should work. He goes, no, no, come and see this. I'm, I get up from my desk, walk like 300 feet across the call center, stand behind him, look at me, hit save. Application crashes. Then I look at him going. Bro, that email address was like 70 something characters long. So after that, I always made a rule. Email address is always 150. I go, the odds of hitting 150 on an email address, pretty small. But it's there. So that's my story about the long email address. Yeah, so always go bigger than you expect when you're planning your data. So a good safe bet is take the longest you think it's going to be and add half again. <laughs> because 75 would have worked. 50 was not enough. So half again of the 50 would have been enough to handle it. All right. So our rate ID is an integer because it's an integer here. And it's also a foreign key. And we're going to draw a relationship, which we know is... Like this. So now we're half done. The rest of it does not, the rest of these don't have long stories tied to it, so it's gonna go quick. So we have projects. Oh Dan, I even took a picture of that. 
with a spelling mistake. So we're going to do project over here. We have the project number and the description. Now, when we look at the project numbers, we will notice that there's a dash in them. The second there's a dash, it's no longer a number. It's a string. Because if I were to define the project number as an integer, then I tried to feed 88, no, sorry, 99 minus 880 would literally try to do it the subtraction and then shove that value into the integer field. Because it's going to try to do the math on it. So we're going to, it's a var card. Our sample data is pretty safe to assume that it's always going to be two dash three digits. But as a rule of thumb, you always want to give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. So we're going to go with eight. So we don't pull a United States of America and their postal codes. So this will be a varcar eight. Actually, you know what? It doesn't need to be a varcar because we know it's always a specific length. We're going to make this a car eight. And that's our primary key. The description will be, they just look like nice short strings. So we're gonna make that a VARCAR 250 just for argument's sake. Okay. And the last bit we have is our timesheet. And our first attribute, which we erased because it was on the other board, is our billing date. Now, this is probably pretty safe to just assume it's a date, not a date time. Um, we would theoretically, in theory, theory, you could slap the time on there, but um, odds are we'd have another entry somewhere that would track when we actually sent it out, which would be what actually is important. So we can just leave the billing date as a date. We know it's part of the primary key, so I'll just put in my PK right away. We have our employee number, our project number, and the hours. And the employee number we know is an integer. The project number, we know it's a car. Eight. And the hours, it depends on the policy of the company. Do we do partial hours or full hours? Where I work, we just do full hours. So if somebody works for on a project for 10 minutes, we bill for an hour. Because the funny thing is when we bill per hour for work is we charge a flat rate every day. So we charge $1,500 a day US. Sounds like a lot of money. But some days it might just be one person working. That's a lot of money being made. Some days it might be four people working at same $1,500. So we tend to round up to the next hour whenever we do invoicing because we don't track our, de our time. We only track our time for the half hour internally. So, you know. So in this case, we're going to make the hours integers. Like such. Add in our relationships. Like that. And now we took our conceptual diagram, turned it to a physical diagram with all the data types that go with it. And you actually heard the logic of why I made some choices about the data types. And it's all in 3NF. It is a fully functional database. Would it be how I design it in the real world? Not necessarily. It would work. It would fit the needs based on the data we were given. And time to take one last picture.
the God. And that is it. Um, one last thing you could do on this is determine what's null and not null if you wanted to. For example, like on the employee, everything's not null. Everything here is not null. I mean, everything's not null because there's not enough data, enough points of data in there to actually make it worth doing the null or the not null. And while I was doing this example, I also did a really good review on database design, basically from scratch. So every major topic was covered while I drew on the board. So um, lab five, I'm not, it's technically due Friday, but I don't really care. I'm already behind on my grading. I usually don't get behind on my grading and I got behind on my grading this term. Uh, I feel kind of bad. Um, I am working on trying to get caught up. So if you guys decide to wait till next week to submit your lab five, great. If you decide to wait till like halfway through the break, that's fine too. Um, as long as you write your midterm, I have enough to report to the department about your progress. <laughs> so I will see you guys in lab either tonight or tomorrow, or I'll see you at midterm next week.